All right, all right, everybody. Welcome to GoGo Talks, brought to you by GoGo Ticks. I'm your host, Malachi Johns, and today we're joined by two of my good friends, uh, Ricky Angles and Felix Chief. What's going on, fellas? What's happening? What's happening? Not too much, Ricky. You got your you got your Wi-Fi Hello, together. Brother. Okay. <laughs> all right. Cool. <laughs> All right, so these two guys, if you don't already know, are family of the Hucklebucks. And did both of you play for XO or just were both of y'all with XO? Uh, before I left Atlanta, I practiced a couple, you know, I was I was attempting to play a show and I left right before the show. But we had another band in Atlanta, but that's Ricky it was more XO. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. All right, well, uh, Chiefy, since you're um, – since your uh, internet is working and you ha- don't have uh, cricket wireless like uh, <laughs> let's, go, let's go to you first give us the give us the uh you know the background of how you got into music how you got into go-go and how that all started uh and before you start real quick everybody that's on instagram right now travis i see you persevere band um uh, everybody head over to youtube.com it's in the comments um youtube.com slash go-go ticks so you can see the other side of the conversation Otherwise, you're just going to be looking at my ugly ass the whole time. So um, head over to YouTube.com slash GoGoTicks. Chiefy, how'd you get into the music industry? Well, first started, I started playing drums late. My father played bass. Um, okay. So I, I used to kick that around the house. But I started playing drums about 14, 15 years old, 10th grade. A um, couple cousins gave me some pieces. I put some stuff together and started banging around. And Ricky used to live up the street. And um in our high school we had a we had a couple bands. Where was this and, uh, where you guys grew up? Uh Hydesville, Riverdale. Okay. Around gotcha. Bla- we went to Bladensburg High School with okay. Lil Boogie and Rapper and some of them. So he was playing with a band called Potential. He heard me playing in the basement and you know, I got with Potential, then we went to another band called New Experience. And like towards the eleventh grade year. Charlie had auditions for um, the Hucklebucks. So we went and auditioned for the Hucklebucks. And um, that's pretty much how I started. So I was like a latecomer, skinny dude, you know, having to play with, with big stomps, dogs, and buggies, and, and, you know, and try to, you know, make up all that time because a lot of them cats was playing in church and when they was young. Mm-hmm. So that's that's how I started on the drums and got to the Hucklebucks. Gotcha. So how did, how did you guys even find out about the – uh auditions to begin with do you remember well, it was a um a band called total groove like we had a few go-go bands at our schools a band called total groove big butch used to uh, deal with mm-hmm. and one of my uh drummer buddies another big dude named chu uh they were together so you know he heard about the auditions he was talking to rob keyboard player rob mm-hmm. and you know he said pleasure manager having auditions and you know we jumped at that of course and um Ran, ran to the studio and did the auditions. And like I said, we I was new to it, but you know we was good enough to make the audition. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it was through actually through another drummer who ended up playing a little bit later once when I was acting up at one point. <laughs> <laughs> it was getting big early. <laughs> did you? Uh, well, we're gonna get into all of that. So did you? Um... Did you? Uh, I just want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put my arm up, and my wife uh, alerted me to the fact that my deodorant has. She, <laughs> so I'm not sweating right now. This is just my deodorant. Uh, but um, so, would you remember anybody that you uh, auditioned against, like any other drummers? Like, do you know who you won out against, or you guys weren't like you weren't there at the same time? No, it wasn't the same time. It was just uh, I knew he needed a cowbell player, a, a keyboard and a drummer and we just went you know and kind of did our things by ourselves mm-hmm. i never really heard of nobody else uh that was at the time what when, when we started playing though e from op tribe used to always say you know i auditioned for charlie 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 ain't like me you know you know charlie you know i wasn't pretty i wasn't pretty boy enough and all that shit. so <laughs> I, <laughs> I do know that's he funny. was that's funny i mean because so, he definitely uh, was capable, okay so but, I, I don't know ricky just went out again so i'm not sure so it might be a a, a tp interview today so we'll see hopefully you get get uh get things back together on his side and get back in here but okay so th- what year was this that you started playing with the hockey box 90 I think it was early 92 when we um, auditioned 
you know, and start building the band. The only one there at the time was Rob. Okay. You know, I think it was a Congo player there, but he he wasn't there too long. So we kind of brought pieces from potential band and new experience bands to both of the bands we were playing with in the high school. You know, as as we came in, we would bring more people in. That's where Saquon came from. And uh well that's it. Me, Ricky, Saquon, Carlos. We were all through those other two bands. And then Joey, I think, came from a whole nother place. You know, we you know, it took time to, to people were coming in and out. Yeah. But um, yeah. Gotcha. And so when did like did, did Charlie ever tell you at the beginning, was it was there like some overarching vision? Or was it just like, hey, we're starting a band? Or was it like, hey, we're starting a band that, you know, I mean, because y'all were known as like the go go boy band, you know, for for you know, to some people at least. Was that yeah. like intentional? Was that what he pitched to you in the first place? Or did he just say we're putting together a band? Yeah, he had the name, he had a story about sitting at a picnic and hearing the name Hucklebuck, seeing kids run around and him and Leora, his wife, saying that they were going to start a band called the Hucklebuck. And of course, we ain't like that name at first, <laughs> but he had a whole plan, a six month plan. We're going to do a PA tape. And, you know, he kind of had a vision and it didn't happen exactly like on the timeline, but everything he said happened. But yeah, the khakis and the dirty buck, the clean yeah. cut, like he didn't want braids, but he, you know, it was a certain look, boy band look. And later yeah. talking to him, he say now, he said, I wanted a new addition that could crank. Yep. He told me that recently. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, he had the whole vision. You know, the first day we went in there, he talked to us. We was we was through the roof. You know, we went home. You know, we've been in little bands, setting up our equipment, playing in wrecks and booking shows, you know, drawing out our flyers. So right. going there and he got a big studio and the whole machine and drum sets and, and, and a, a, B and C studios. You know, we, we were super psyched. What did you know about him beforehand? Like what made you get, what made you interested in auditioning for the Huckabucks? Like what, what was it that you knew about? Like, what did you heard about Charlie or? His well, main, mainly it was pleasure. Okay. He had pleasure band. And um, we had rehearsed like one of our bands previously rehearsed at, at the studio. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had an, you knew we had a nice facility and um, that's pretty much all. I just knew pleasure band. And he used to live around the corner from Bladesburg, hot cold sweat. You know, I kind of knew about hot cold sweat, mm -hmm. but just more so pleasure was popular. Lil Boogie went to Bladesburg. Mm -hmm. So we just knew they was on the radio and had the Christmas songs. And at that time, the jukebox was out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Magogo Live, one of them Capital Center shows was playing. Every time you come home from school and pleasure and EU and some of them was on there. So it was almost like that's a way to get to that level. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Gotcha. So that was that was all I really knew going in. So at that point, was that so? Did you have design? Did you did anybody? I mean, specifically, I know you can only speak for yourself, but do you know if anybody had aspirations of being anything bigger than Pleasure Hot Cold Sweat Junkyard, like on a more national level, or was it just we want to be like Hot Cold Sweat? Yeah, well, we was trying to be Go Go Stars. I don't think we. I know, you know, in my frame of mind back then, I wasn't trying to be, I mean, not in that uh, sense, thinking that the Hugglebucks would be that big. Um, you know, of course, I was a Michael Jackson fan and I, I was a music fan. So the idea of, of doing that some kind of way was probably in the back of my mind, but being a drummer for the band, of course, and as a go-go band, especially mm -hmm. back then, before a lot of the radio stuff and, I mean, before some of the stuff we even did that, that um, opened our minds to that, those possibilities. I don't think, I definitely was, and I don't think we we were in the beginning. But once Charlie started talking and laying out some of the stuff and, and you know, just giving us fundamental knowledge and how mm -hmm. stuff worked and, you know, being different and how we could make noise being a boy band with the look and all those things, I think our minds did get expanded over time mm -hmm. where it was a point where I thought, we was going to be national, you mm -hmm. know, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not, know, at the beginning. not at the beginning. Not at the beginning, no. Gotcha. So, uh, well, I, I was about to switch over to Ricky, but he went out again. But um, so, he, yeah, uh, you, you talked E up. He's he's on the on the feed. He said, <laughs> I got out from the Hucklebucks and was told I didn't have the look for what he wanted. And I was pissed for years about that. <laughs> for years. I yeah, know. for years. For years. Um, and uh, Robert Bryce on here, my man Chief and Ricky. 
And uh, Alfonso asked, are they from D.C.? So Alfonso, he answered that earlier. They're from Hyattsville. Um, so, well, the, at least uh, Chief Yen yeah. and, and Ricky are. So yeah, where, I mean, we, we lived in D.C. like everybody else moved from D.C. When you we was young, we lived in D.C., moved here, back and forth. But, yeah, we went to school. We was raised here pretty much, predominantly, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what was – um, just, just so you know, like the purpose of, of the reason I started doing this show was to try to connect the dots between the like things that we do and we take for granted in GoGo and we just say, well, that's how we do it in GoGo mm -hmm. and then compare and contrast it to how it's done on the national music scene and try to find the sort of intersectionality to find out what is it, what, what are the things that we're doing right and what are the things that we're doing wrong and, um, you know, it to see if there's a way to really propel this outside of here. As you know, that's always been my passion. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. when you guys were starting, I mean, 92. So that was, yeah, you guys didn't really pop for a few years after that. So that's about the same same uh, gestation period, I guess, as I had with Marvel Sauce. Because I started Marvel Sauce in 2003. We never hit till 2007. So um, so what was the what was the rehearsal structure like like how did how and and how did it differ from what your other i mean i know you had hadn't been playing that long uh for other bands but how did it differ from you know from what else you were doing well having roy you know roy battle yeah was our producer yep. so and, and funky ned in the beginning it was funky ned and roy battle mostly and they were bringing up a guy like Sorry. Nike from trouble funk and different people. So just having that production, basically that authority, in a sense, you know, that that uh not really authority, but you know, uh the structure. Right. From from trained musicians that have done it to be able to tell us what to do. So it was a little more intense and uh which was helpful because you know, when you're in a young band, everybody just hitting thinking they know what they're doing. So we learn how to uh play in the space and discipline and the not lean on the Congos to put your foot on the drums to tie your shoe. Poking their head is doing push ups, you know, different things. But since Ricky and if he want to talk about that, and, and then even the um the frequency of the practices changed. Like we practiced a lot. Like I right. said, being as though I started late, I needed a lot of work. A lot mm -hmm. of us did. We were all kind of newcomers, so we we needed that that boot camp. Wow. I, I muted you real quick, uh, Ricky, because it's a lot of background noise, and when when you're on, can't hear Chiefy. So sorry. But yeah, it, it got real. It got real in that situation. And like I, I said, I was a little rebellious to it at first. Look, it just started, and, I, and I'm in there talking shit to Funky Ned and, and Roy. You know, <laughs> we're, gonna get, we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that. But while we got Ricky, I want to try to get some part of his story real quick before he okay. cuts out again. So, um, all right, Ricky, take your mask off. And uh, tell us, tell us how you got into the industry. All uh, right, what, 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 where did Chief leave off at? What's well, up? No, we, I'm asking about you specifically. He told his story about how he got into the industry. Turn, turn your, your speaker down because I can hear myself. That's what, that's what the issue is. Turn my speaker down. Yeah. Man, that's crazy, man. Yeah. Sound like an alien on that joint. Yeah, a lot of feedback and stuff going on. I apologize, man. I got to get, uh, I'm getting too old, man. I don't know how I work or anything anymore. <laughs> it's all good. It seemed like that That was good. I, yeah, I don't you're good now. I feedback anymore and I can hear you. So, so go ahead. So, so how did you get into music and, and, uh, and, and tell your story of how that came and got to the Hucklebucks. Um, all right, so let me start by saying, like, I, um, I, uh, the first band I played in was a uh, was a potential band. Um, I'm not sure if Chief already broke that down, but um, I ended up playing the potential band for uh, since like the uh, the late '80s. I played a potential band, and then. Um, I ended up playing with a band called Clicks. Uh, it was an all-girl band. Um, um, uh, Miss Mac, she managed the band. Miss Mac is uh is Re's uh was Re's manager, 
and uh, she managed uh, Clicks and uh, uh, played play some wonderful shows with Clicks. I was actually the Congo player with Clicks, and then I ended up leaving Clicks. Uh, I ended up playing in Clicks with, uh, with with Ivy uh, from Pleasure, the lead rapper from Pleasure. She was in the band when I was in the band, and um, we had Opio. He was a uh, uh, he from, um, I believe, Pure Elegance, but uh, he was teaching the keyboard, the girl keyboard players how to play a lot of the stuff, you know what I'm saying, how to hit the right way and all that type of stuff. So um, so I played in the band with them, and then uh, uh, and then after that, I ended up playing in a band called um, Experience, New Experience. Um, and then, and uh, Chiefy brought me over to that band, and and... And for that band, I ended up playing like the cowbell, and that's it. I might have did some little hype man parts or whatever, but I was on front line just 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 playing the cowbell, being quiet as I don't know what. I, I had all of this talent. I was I was bursting at the bubble, you know, I was bursting at the seams, but you know, I, I ended up um just playing the cowbell. But um and when I was playing the potential band, I was actually bit I was actually the keyboard player in that band. Okay, so I want to slow down a little bit because you, okay, went, okay, you went from keyboard, you went from keyboard to congos to cowbell. So how did you even get started playing keyboard? Like, how did you get started playing music in the first place? Like, what made you even qualified to to fill those positions? All right, so uh, of course I, I grew up in a family that uh of musicians my uncle um he actually played guitar with um herbie hancock you know what i'm saying so we i grew up in a household with pianos in them all the time all my uncles and aunts played piano and, and and all of that so i was learning all of that learning how to play by ear you know just by dealing with them mm -hmm. and uh when i got with potential band i actually um i i told them that i could um i could sing so i actually went into rehearsal um as the singer or whatever, right? And I, you know, I didn't know how to sing, uh, but uh, but I told him I could sing. I got into rehearsal, and everything was cool. But um, I end up, you know, every time we was learning a song, I was teaching the keyboard player. I was like, now nah, play it like this, play, you know, play it like this, boom, boom, boom. So um, we had this one fatal show. <laughs> uh, I don't know if TV told you about this one time, but we played on this big butch show, and uh, um, I man, I got on. You know, it was our it was our debut. <laughs> and I messed around and got stuck. I literally got stuck, man. Like it was like in a movie, man. I could I couldn't say anything. So I was sitting on I was on stage. The band was cranking and I was stuck. Oh, you just I froze? Say nothing, huh? You, froze you just froze? I just, I, man, I froze all the way up, man. And it was like it was like hundreds of hundreds of kids in this joint, man. And um, uh, I froze up. And and, and my man Ty, who was the, the backup rapper. He just stepped in and was just putting everybody on display and blah, blah, blah. Man, I just chilled out for the whole show. I played the second dude, you know what I'm saying? I played the, the non-lead rapper, let Ty be the lead rapper the whole time. And when we got back in practice, they was like, um, I think Ty should be the lead rapper. <laughs> I was like, you said you were the singer. How did you move to be the lead rapper now? Because I'm getting oh. confused, bro. You're going jumping all over the place now. How oh, are you okay, the okay. rapper? All right, so... I went in as a singer. I couldn't sing, you know uh, what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm on front line now, you know what I'm saying? We building the band, you okay. know what I'm saying? We building the band. So I'm on front line. So, uh, you know, the, the dude Ty came in and he was rapping and all that type of stuff. He, so he automatically took the rapper role, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, he, he the number two, he the rapper role or whatever. So while we in, in rehearsal, like I said, I'm telling the keyboard player this. I done brought TV to the band. So I'm saying, yeah, we need to play this type of beat. And I'm kind of directing stuff. So I ended up, taking on that role in practice. So I was killing it in practice, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But messed around and got to that show, man, and got stuck. <laughs> I, 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 I for real froze up, man. And uh, they said, uh, well, well, since you've been teaching the keyboard player thing, you know what I'm saying, and showing him how to play, well, go ahead back there with him and help him out. And mm -hmm. I ended up being the keyboard player. It's some, it's some footage of that online of us um, practicing at Charlie Studio, some footage of that, me being the keyboard player with the, butch, with the big bush chimp <laughs> and all that type of stuff. So um so so yeah so that's how that went so I was playing keyboards with Potential Band and then uh end up playing uh Congos for Clicks mm -hmm. Clicks Band and that was a wonderful experience uh, meeting uh you know a lot of the guys uh, uh from um you know just from the area or whatever from um DC and all that type of stuff that was playing and then uh got a new experience man oh see that ain't me though <laughs> who else on that one <laughs> Yeah. Which is, I don't know how it's ringing because it's on Do Not Disturb, so I don't know. <laughs> anyway, all right, so you, so you, you, you started playing with who now? 
Roger. Um, so I end up playing with a uh, uh, new experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Chiefy, Chiefy brought me over to new experience or whatever, and um, uh, and then I, we, then we, in this I said again. What were you playing in New Experience? This was the cowbell, right? Yeah, yeah. New Experience, I was playing the cowbell. Chiefy, I mean, uh, Carlos Carlos said, look, you can just play the cowbell, man. All you got to play is this beat right here. Get busy, busy, get busy, get busy, busy. And I, you know, I played that on the cowbell. <laughs> See, I played that for every song. I played yeah. that joint for every song, man. That's so, um, so, yeah, so, so, uh, so, so after... Um, so I, I ended up having a fallout with the uh, with the manager of uh, New Experience, and I ended up uh, uh, getting a call, a phone call from Chiefy, because Chiefy was still playing the band. He was like, "Look, um, Charlie, a hey, uh, Charlie looking for some people to start this new band. You know, Charlie from you know uh, uh, Pleasure and High Cold Sweat. You know, what I'm saying Charlie Fenwick. He 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 about to um, start this another band. So um uh so so me and Chiefy said, all right, well let's let's." Let's call Carlos and let's go ahead and go practice see what he need. So we went up there. He needed all the pieces. The only piece he had in there was Rob, uh, uh, Rob, uh, one of the keyboard players. And uh, we went in there and um, and and we I had to watch Chiefy rehearse. You know what I'm saying? Something that they taught him right quick. Uh, Rob gave Carlos this weird bass line. You know what I'm saying? But uh, uh, Carlos pulled that off and they was like, all right, now what you do? I said, well, I, pl I, I play the cowbell. He said, all right, let me see you play the cowbell. This is Charlie, right? Uh -huh. So I started playing the cowbell. He was like, all right, can you dance? Can you dance while playing? So I started doing the running man. I started doing the running man while playing the cowbell or whatever, right? He was like, all right, good. All right. Look, look y'all did good. Y'all y'all got it. You know what I'm saying? So um, uh, um, we, you know, so that's how that started with the Huckabucks, man. So, we, real, we so real quick, though, what you said you felt you had a falling out with the manager of the other band. What was that about? <laughs> All right, man. Okay. All right. So what happened was me and Chief, we were probably like 14 years old, Chief. Yeah, like 10th grade. We were like, we like 14 years old, man. And um, you got you just got real quiet, Ricky. I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, my phone phone ringing. I got it on. Yeah, I don't know how that yeah. works. But uh, yeah, so uh, me and Chief, like 14. Oh, my God. Oh, you flipped it on Stop up again. You got to put it on airplane mode. Yeah. Lil Ricky is gone. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Man, that was crazy. Uh, All right, you can hear me now? now? You you good now? Yeah, we can hear you again. All right, so you're 14 years old and you trying to fight the manager. What what happened? <laughs> now, I can't even hear y'all. But look, so um yeah, so um, we 14 years old. We go to this dude's club like that was on Kenilworth Avenue. Man, he had a club. Uh, it was like a Jamaican joint or something called the Hibiscus. We went to the club manager and I told him I said, look, um you know I be I, you know I be around here all the time. I'll never see no cars outside. I can guarantee you we can get about 200, 300 kids in this joint if you'll let my band come in here and play or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. We negotiated with this dude, and he ended up letting us come in there and, and setting up and playing, and we packed that joint out. We packed mm -hmm. out the um, the hibiscus or whatever. We packed that joint out, and what happened was, uh, so so we making a little money or whatever, you know what I'm saying? We, we collecting all the money, we making all the money, and then the manager said, hey, um, um, we 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 about to um play for another band. We're gonna open up for another band at the at, at our spot. We we started the spot. So I was like, nah, nah, we ain't gonna be opening up for no bands playing. This is our spot. We supposed to be the headliners on this joint. And she said, uh, well, you know, I don't, you know, I, I really mess with the manager or whatever, and that's kind of what we're gonna do. I said, all right, well, that's what y'all gonna do. Like, I, I don't want to be no part of it, man. I, and I backed out. I backed out of the whole situation. Wow, you quit the band over one show. Man, I, I quit the band. It was principal, man. It was principal, uh, Malachi. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay. All right. So, so all right. So, we, we're kind of at the same point in the story now where, uh, you know, where Chiefy left off. So, I'm going to try to bring you both in. So, okay. So, you started with the Hugger Bucks. Chiefy was talking about how, 
the well, I guess Chief had, hadn't played with as many bands as, as you, so I'm interested in your perspective. What um, from a you know, he was telling us about Roy and and uh, you know, and uh, Funky Ned being involved in the rehearsals and making them more structured and all that. I'm just the reason I'm asking this and drilling down on this is because if you know, I interviewed Kyrie from Northeast Groovers, I talked to Jam and Jeff, I talked to uh, you know, Donna Floyd, I don't, I don't remember who else, but you know, almost in every single instance of someone that I've talked to that was into go go and started go go when they were younger and when it was, you know, and, and, and a band that became popular, the recurring theme is they rehearsed three, four, five times a week for five, six, seven hours at a time. Whereas now it's like guys want to rehearse for two hours a week, maybe. And then, right. you know, right. then the bass player is 45 minutes late. So you really only get to practice for an hour. And then they wonder why things just aren't the same. And that's why. So yeah, yeah. let me tell you this. The Huckabucks, we practice every single day. We practice. So some of the guys were still in school. They would leave school and come right to practice or whatever. We practice every single day for months straight. Before we ever, before Huckabucks ever hit any stage or anything, we rehearsed every day until that one, to that one big show. And the, the first big show we did was out of town in, in Virginia, all the way out in Virginia somewhere. When we rehearsed every day, and I ain't lying, that was the that was the plan. When you finish doing what you're doing, going to church, all of that, and <laughs> man, come come on to practice. We're gonna go to practice. And roughly, how long would you guys rehearse when you did rehearse? About you remember about how long the practices were? What do you think? Three, probably four like about hours, five, six hours, chief. Yeah, sometimes at least three or four. Mm -hmm. And what about what about? like structurally, like what, how did a rehearsal go? Like, what did you do? Like, what was, you know, cause there's a difference between getting together in a rehearsal space and playing through some of the songs and actually rehearsing, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm interested to know what sort of what the, you know, what the structure of that was. Do you remember? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump in on this one. Then uh, Chief can uh, back me up, you know, say, say how you feel or whatever. But uh, what I remember is in the beginning, you know, we were trying to gel together um, because, you know, now we got Rob, you know, so me, me, Carlos and Chief, was, you know, we were, you know, we came from other bands together. And um, uh, uh, this is my first time. Uh, oh, <laughs> playing with the other guys. Yeah, yeah, there you go. We cool. were mainly building a set, uh, building a set and building the cohesiveness, of course, with me and uh, Congo play the percussion. So locking that in and at the same time, building a set to go perform with. And um, even with the dance that incorporating the dancing because, you know, they dance and, right. you know, writing hooks and you like kind of Roy, Roy working with the percussion, Roy working with everybody, just telling mm -hmm. us the do's and don'ts. And uh, so building stamina for us, for everybody, learning how to play with the stage low, that was an important thing. Just in case your monitors don't work, if you learn how to play with the stage low, you'll be all right. Yep. So uh, the dance steps, uh, building a set to co go perform with, uh, and kind of locking that one set in. Like we had sets that we would know almost to the bar, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to mess it up. And right. like he said, we were going out of town and training first. We would do a lot mm -hmm. of out of town shows. And so the, the, the first coming in, we were building that set, getting the dance moves, building the cohesiveness. And as we started doing shows, we were kind of taking some of the stuff from the set, the covers we were playing or whatever original stuff, adding in, you know, the, the dynamics, the stops, the, the top, the break. And um, then building that into an album. I mean, building that into songs we could record, which end up becoming the stuff we recorded later. Right. But just off the break, it was just more repetition and, and you know, building stamina, especially for me. I just know I was, you know, I had a lot of work. And mm -hmm. Saquon, even when Saquon came, he was a late comer too. Mm -hmm. he used to practice with the with the uh, ankle weights on his wrist mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know, because we had to get get strong. Because right. you know, go go. That's the energy, straight energy and stamina. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and just over and over, and Ned was real strict. Do it again, do it again, do it again, you know, sell it, sell it, you know, like to the point where 
you know, it, 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 it's, it's tough. You be getting tired uh, uh, hearing that, but in hindsight, you glad it, you know you glad you had that type of training. Roy yep. was a little more uh, Roy more laid back than Ned. You know, he was a little more chill. Ned right. more like a, a James Funk. Right, you right. Know, like he not having a Stevie Wonder, a James Brown, uh, you know, them type of cats that you hear about. Um, but that was mainly it, building the set to go perform with and building so the family. How, how many for how many months did you rehearse before you guys played the first show? Do you remember? Like roughly? Yeah. I'm not sure. It had to be. Because if we came up there in ninety two the early 92, it, it probably might have been like eight months or so because Metro World was one of the first things we did too. Mm -hmm. While we were going out of town uh, training, we did Metro World and I know we did that at the end of 92. So it might have been within that within that year. Okay. From like January, February to, you know, so maybe, maybe eight or 10 months when we they, they took us out of Ashland, I think was the first one, Lynchburg, you know, we used to do uh, bowling greens, a lot of the out of town stuff. So, right, right. um, yeah, to, to get conditioned to come back to this main city and play in front yeah, of the backyard. Can, and then. <laughs> no matter what, like you can, you can rehearse until you're blue in the face, but when you hit the stage, it's a whole different speed. They yeah, need that situation. Yeah. 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 So that was smart. So, that was smart of them to, to take you guys out of town first, um, to, uh, you know, to kind of, warm things up a little bit because for those that don't know, typically speaking, you know, when you're doing Northern Virginia or, you know, it's places like that, they're, they're a little more forgiving. Easy. They yeah. Have as much, you know, they don't have the top, the top bands don't come down there as much. So right. they're just, they're just hungry Happy for to get anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and I think that helped build um, the bond between, the uh band too because you know we we rolled down in the van together the old, you know charlie had them vans so we in the, and we in the van together and joking and joning and, and playing and you know so i think that helped get us closer the brotherhood too at the same time so right yeah how important was that because there's a lot of uh you know i mean i think as we, as we get older and we learn you know, I guess we learn the ways of the world. Like when we're young and we're in high school or whatever, it's just like, we're just doing it because it's fun and we want to do it and be a part of something. And then as you get older, you know, it sort of, it becomes more of a business and more of a profession. And I start to hear more of the, you know, oh, I'm not in this to make friends and I don't need to be your, your homie. And you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just here for the money or whatever. So how, how, um, you know, how important was that bond at, at you know at, at the young age to really keep things together i think it's real important because you know in hindsight i look back and just playing with the other bands i played with of course i don't think it'll ever be nothing like that because our mind we were so young didn't have bills didn't have you know the, the, the worries that you get as you get older or the, the knowledge of the business and like you said you're doing it for fun yeah so but but just looking back and just how close we was from those trips and having to come out and it's freezing cold and your whole your pants wet and, and everything and you got to ride back yeah and, um you know the little fights and arguments which it wasn't many mm -hmm. um i think that's real important i think mm -hmm. that's because it come off on stage with with the uh synergy with the band For and sure. i think i think that's definitely major that's, that was probably a major part of you know our sound and, and us having fun on stage which translates to the crowd i think Hundred yeah, percent, and I, and I think that's a lot of the reason why now, uh, you know, I mean, there's a mi there's a million reasons, but there's I think one of the reasons why GoGo -Go is not as powerful as it used to be is because obviously most of the people in it are older now, and there's a lot of the you know trading around, yeah. things, and so you can't build that gel, you can't build that sound, and you're. Coming at it like I know when I was playing with Northeast, like when I played with the band that I played in Annapolis that I first started playing in, it was like a blast, like the time of my life. Like every time we played, I was excited. I was like, oh man, we got to play tonight. And of course, when I first started playing with Northeast Groovers, I was like that. But after about a year of playing three times a week in the same place every week, it just kind of starts to be like a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like that's sort of, sort of what's happened to Go Go you know, uh, on a, on a bigger level over time is just everybody just sort of looks at it as like, 
a part-time job right now as opposed to like we really want to make shit amazing so but anyway i digress from the story so um so okay so you do metro world and the end of 92 heading into 93 when did when did you really start to realize like okay this is this is not just a band like this is really something's happening here it's not just a local you know like some regular shit like we can we could do something um around that time i guess early 93 charlie uh well you know he was doing marketing so we was having magazine articles and uh we did a couple magazine interviews um stuff like that you know which was different than i had experienced um and you remember what the magazines were i mean was it local stuff or was it like yeah go go swings was one okay I, I think i think it was something in word up ricky was saying that yesterday mm -hmm. i don't remember that one but it, you know it might have been like you know because charlie had he got connects in, in the business so just because it was charlie he would you know he was basically selling us the dream and he was following through on it so the more that he would divulge and, and show us things um the, the idea got bigger that it could be bigger and when mm -hmm. we started doing the outside shows and tgc so you're getting radio coverage and mm -hmm. uh stuff like that and i think when we started recording the album i think we started recording the album i just remember coming home excited like man i'm telling y'all wait till y'all hit it just you know and i i had a feeling that it was going to be big mm -hmm. and you know and you would hear about people in the streets talking about it like charlie got a new band just mostly off with pleasure and high cold sweat charlie's name right right but, um and then people would hear about us or come to the studio you know other bands practicing and like funk will come talk to us a lot so um and know you know the words encourage encouraging words or whatever they would kind of kind of tell us like y'all on y'all way so mm -hmm. i think that was that was a big part of it i don't remember when we met tom and becky mm -hmm. but i that that was big like what publicist like what what is you know it just you know it was just different like hold up who was these people like you know right for those that don't know who, I'm, I'm assuming most people know who funk is talking about james funk from Rassens. those who don't know tom and becky are we're talking about tom goldfogel and becky marcus tom goldfogel is currently the manager of uh chuck brown has been for a long time becky is the manager of Rassens right now but they also at the time had liaison records which was right. pretty much a, it was a one-stop district district distribution company one-stop distributor uh that basically distributed all of the go-go -Go and all of the baltimore uh house and club music uh throughout all the regional record stores so any any albums that were being put out by rio you know on future records or charlie uh, what was charlie's record company called again um sound by charlie I that was before it was stuck thump yeah thump, thump, thump yeah, down. Thump, but if you yeah. look at some of our stuff it's to say sbc sound by charlie oh, really? is that what it was back then? okay guys yeah. changes the thump. Gotcha. That's crazy. Yeah. so any of those any of those albums were being distributed you know but meaning put in the actual record stores uh by liaison which is tom and becky's company so you said they came around and started teaching you about or talking to you about publishing and how that worked and right i mean i knew you know they was from liaison so just i'm just saying i'm trying to think of the things that made me say okay this is about to be big mm -hmm. and okay just coming up the barry farms day you know the malcolm x days the unifest mm -hmm. right well, I, well optimistic and uh publicity these certain bands was in the slot we almost park shows right and we mm -hmm. coming up under under that in like 92 we might be on the bottom and then you know just 93 94 we just start moving up that ladder and i was just like okay and then it became the red hot huckabuck i said oh yeah we out of here so that, <laughs> that was a big thing too and just okay. being on them big shows like seeing all them people right was like this this is different right here this is this is big right and like um i don't know it felt it felt different from the other bands it felt good i don't mm -hmm. know if it's because we knew we had the training or we just knew we had the right group of dudes and we was close you know what i'm saying we was having fun it just felt right, right. so i think that was um a part of it too going into like like i said recording the album you know having the bud in the cut and sexy girl and them joints like man trying to figure out man which one you know which one y'all think gonna be the the joint so so real quick before we get to that so what how did the how did the studio like when you started recording the album that was well, i assume that was your first time recording right 
Yeah. What was the process like? Because the way that go-go bands typically uh, record is not the same way that most other artists record, but it sounds like you, you guys, you started recording the album pretty, pretty quickly after uh, getting started. Right. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like you've been playing out for years and then you recorded an album. It's uh, the reason I'm saying this is because it seems like most go-go bands, they, they start, they play, they play a bunch of shows and then they try, go and try to recreate in the studio what they were doing live, which I think right. to the detriment of, the genre because you can't ever recreate what you do live in the studio. So what was the process like with Charlie? Was it like you, you were rehearsing and then you started recording before you guys started playing? How did that work? I think we were doing out of town more, just like training up, training up. And maybe, maybe we had started playing here. I don't remember exactly. Right. But, and then we started to create the material to record in the studio. I don't think the material we recorded on Chronic Breakdown, at least, was was what we was doing live. Maybe bits and pieces of stuff, but I think we we rehearsed it and then went to went to record it. And Charlie had the C studio where Joey was in the booth by himself. Uh, the front line was in like a sliding glass door. The keyboard, you know, we was all sectioned off, mm -hmm. and so we was recording like that. And being as though I was a newcomer, um, and you know, recording is actually different from playing live. Yep. Um, especially on the drums, it was like as far as tempo. I can't explain it, but yeah. I couldn't quite get tempo and, and you know the fluctuation. Or well, I'm playing too fast. Play? It's, it's kind of like you got to no no click, okay. but just to keep it consistent, it's like you got to pull back. I can't explain it. I, I kind of mastered it now, I but I was probably just too anxious playing fast, so. I couldn't really record. We tried to record a few times with me. Mm -hmm. And then I think we even changed the material within that. We had stuff, some changes that was made. And then that's when they brought Blue Eyed in and they went into the B studio, the rehearsal studio, and they played that together. I think they tried it with me together first too, but I just couldn't get the lock all the way consistent. And that's when they brought Blue in, but it was, um, it was basically material we, we practiced, we uh, rehearsed to record, I believe. So is blue, blue that's blue eye playing on chronic breakdown then or just on yeah. certain okay. Well so yeah. I wanna that's important because well first of all, how did you feel about that? Uh reaction. At first I was a little upset because I had played the stuff. You know, we tried to play it, which look everybody probably was because you know, we doing that. So that's a lot of time that you put in. Mm -hmm. Um and first I was, I was a little upset. I mean, of course not at blue, mm -hmm. but just upset that I wasn't ready, but I understood, you know, cause I was like up under Roy. I, I sit right. under Roy and how you, what's this, how you do this. And, and so, you know, I understood, he explained it, he would let me hear it and I would hear the, the fluctuation and stuff. So, you know, it just kind of messed up though. It just kind of felt like that and the homies and I'm sitting there on the sideline, you know, like, dang. And I was, I was a little upset. I ain't like to listen to chronic breakdown. I really well, didn't like it at first. The reason I bring that up is because this is this is I think one of the big differences between Gogo -Go and and you know the larger music industry. That is that is a very That's, common right thing right that happens in the music industry. Not there's a, a, almost always there are session players that come in and play that are right. not the guys that are actually in the band or that tour with the band or that are in the pictures or stuff like that. Because it is a totally different skill set. It's totally different to re record in a studio than it is to perform live. You know what I mean? Right. And so I think to Gogo's detriment, again, like I said earlier, we always try to go in and record what we do live and make it in mm -hmm. the studio. And because of the fact that, I mean, it sounds like you're not one of them, but because of the fact that the egos in Gogo -Go are so huge that that's almost just unheard of. Like people don't like, oh, what do you mean? I'm the drummer. I'm playing on this. Right. Or, you know, we, we got five dudes on the front line and everybody needs to have a verse in every song. So that's why the songs are 15 minutes long. Right. And the radio right. is never, ever going to play them. You know what I mean? So right. that's the thing to me that, that, uh, you know, that, that they made that happen. And that says a lot, you know, about your character that even though you felt, you know, a certain kind of way about it, that you understood, you know what I mean? Especially at that young age, because, 
you know, from my experience with Gogo, very few people would have been cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> and like you said, I didn't realize that, like you said, on a bigger scale that that's what takes place at that point. Yeah. But even that would have made it, you know, like, oh, yeah, I get it. But, yeah, I, I kind of just fell back. And um, I think Roy told me, uh, like you just said, it was the sum of the songs. I was like, so am, am I on any other Roy? He was like, yeah, I cut, cut you in or you probably try to make me feel better. But later, you know, becoming an engineer, and so he ain't cut me in on none of that. And just listen back at it, it like, hell no, you ain't cut me in. But my name still say, you know, they get, they put my names on, on there. So that was, you know, I was young. But like I said, I, I don't think I acted out or nothing. But just internally, I had a little animosity. And now, I, I'm, now I'm, I'm listening to Chronic Breakdown, like, you know, freely and could, could enjoy it. Like, God, there you go. That, joint, that joint is serious. Yeah, no, nah, absolutely is one of the one of the iconic albums of, of uh, the entire genre for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So okay, so you're you're recording the album. Um, you say, things start to pick up with the shows. You're, you're you're the red hot huckabucks now. You feel like things are are going to be happening. When did the what was it like, or or did did it feel a certain kind of way when they started playing the records on the radio? Like, did you did you feel how did you feel about that? Oh man, that was crazy. Like, I just that was that was magical right there. There's nothing. Even like though you you kind of knew it was coming or mm -hmm. hoped it was coming because of Charlie and right. Pleasure was playing and just how he would you know Charlie mm -hmm. he could size you up now he could talk so he would he would tell you you know he was telling us this gonna happen and this gonna happen so you kind of know it's coming you mm -hmm. heard you hear the material and you gotta wait though like we record we had to wait like almost like the people to get it. So we waiting, we waiting. And then um, I think, you know, of course the, the CDs and stuff came and they saw playing it. That, that's, that's an amazing feeling. That's, that was an amazing feeling. And then going to the radio station at that time too, you know, that was, that, that was crazy. You know, you never, I never been in a radio station. And right. so to go talk to, uh, I think it was DJ cool. 1580 was the first people to play it. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Steph Lover and uh, Live Squad, that and I think 1580 was in PGC. If I remember right, uh -huh. DJ Cool was the first person that we went to see. He said they knocked on the door. They got the album, knocked on the door, and was like, "Man, you can have this track, you know, whatever." He said he started playing it. They came back, knocked on the door, like we need that, and that's <laughs> how it got to PGC. Um, yeah. But I think 50, 1580 was the was the first catapult of of, of playing it. And so, you know, just meeting him and uh, Tigger, I think, was around the time, the native one. You know, the, that, that whole experience was amazing. That's All the way to the point where it played so much on a Saturday morning or something, 92, I mean, 93, is on 95, 90, where you almost get tired of it. And, and I hate to say that now because I wish I could get that type of uh, action right now. Right. But <laughs> right. you almost be like, man, look, you're going to turn that off. Or walking right. up the street, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they playing it that's amazing because they don't even know who you are you're just looking like if he only knew right and then i think i went to uh, my girl was in a, a a year under me so it was it was playing when i was right after i graduated so i mm -hmm. went back to a prom uh her prom and mm -hmm. they playing it at the prom and you know i'm cool i got on my linen suit this is my second time coming so i i'm cool i'm just chilling at the table and i remember the kids coming say, ah! <laughs> like, this, like this is immature, you know. I'm in the right, club right. at the Ibex, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm Jack getting mature, so I'm looking at these. You know, they like it's almost like they teasing me, and I'm sitting back like, yeah. yeah. I remember that moment was crazy too, but yeah, that's amazing, man. To, to finally uh, hear yourself on the radio. Yeah, that's indeed. Cool. There's definitely no feeling like it, and especially when it's yeah. I mean, because you guys, I think you guys had multiple songs in rotation at the same time too, right? Which is because we had "Welcome to DC" and "Miracles," and it's it's we it's super weird to hear like two songs at the same right. time and playing right. in the morning show and shit like that, you know. But you, there was a couple of them going at the same time with you guys too, right? Was it Bud and Sexy Girl were both in rotation? Yep, and get down, and it's time get pretty down. much. I think Bud and Sexy Girl was probably the most popular, but right. all of them was, 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 you know, at a time, I guess, m maybe one started, then the next one, but like within like a month, they was all spinning or two months or three months or something. I don't remember exactly. They was right. all playing. Yeah. Right. That's crazy. That's what's up. That's what's up. So 
that was what was that 93 94 what was what year was that i don't remember exactly it seemed like 94 maybe when it started playing okay uh it seemed like 95 96 was the the biggest mm -hmm. i'm not sure but i'm thinking 94 because like i said i graduated 94 went mm -hmm. to the prom and they was the dj was playing it so i guess 94 95 and 96 i would think 95 was the height of it gotcha, I, I, gotcha. yeah yeah. Makes, yeah i graduated 94 too and then yeah yeah so that makes sense so i i remember uh this is what what was it always the same band members like did it was there a lot of turnover or was it always the same guys it was you it was the same once joey came along when we first started when we did metro world we had ty the guy we had from potential yeah, he's on, you know. on here now ty Duckett. yeah oh, yeah man. so ty was there and then uh he had some stuff happen he couldn't play and then joey came you know, with the albums and stuff, Ty kind of did all the work that Joey kind of came in and got the got the shine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so from that point, from when we recorded Chronic Breakdown, it was all the same guys all the way up until Saquon started, uh, you know, going through his stuff. And you know, we had to get a different Congo player, and you know, here and there. Mm -hmm. Oh, so he, I didn't. Re so he wasn't in the band when he when he passed i didn't realize that i thought he was still in the band yeah that was a couple of years later he oh. was kind of yeah but you know the money thing and you know stuff was happening he was kind of he just wouldn't show up and you know that left me in a in a sling i was i, was, I used to be upset yeah. cussing everybody yeah. out who y'all yeah. bringing me that's when left hand jason and uh kenny you know they would bring different different uh guys mm -hmm. and he would you know he was coming in and out he was like phasing out Mm -hmm. I think 96, late 96, mm -hmm. you know, he was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ricky left around that time, too. The, the double CD we did, uh, You Better Move Something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ricky kind of left in the process of recording that before that came out. So that was when it started to change. Ricky was gone and Saquon was gone. And then Ty came back. Uh, and was kind of doing, Joey was still there. So it was Ty was running the two. And Joey, but Lamont was always there. And you know, towards the end of the '96, well, towards the end of '97, I guess, in the '98, that's when it just kind of started. You know, AJ came in and would lead talk. Uh, uh, that was it. AJ, because Joey ended up. The, the, the Joey left or got cut. I don't remember exactly, but it was just it started getting bad once people start. Once the main pieces start start to fall off it's, it's harder to keep that i want to get into that the only reason i ask about that about was it the same people though is because it's it's because i remember you guys came and played in annapolis at the stanton center and oh yeah my old band occupation opened up and i don't remember who it was but somebody in your band tried to steal me and were like <laughs> come play with us and y'all were the, the red hucklebucks at the time, like the biggest shit going. And I was like, no, I'm with my band. You know, this is my band. These are my guys that I'm, yeah. you know, I'm sticking with my guys. And it seems like that mentality is just totally flown out of the window. And so that's why I was curious as to when it started happening with okay. hucklebucks. You know what I'm saying? Because it just was not, it, it's just now it's like whoever's got the, the most money or whoever's the most. We've got my number. Yeah, right. yeah, you know what I mean. As opposed to like, yeah, I'm trying. We're really trying to build something here. You know what I mean. So that just kind of segues into what you were talking about. And so my, so what, what were the reasons that people were leaving? Like, what was the, what was the thing? I wish Ricky was able to get back. I don't know. He, it doesn't even seem like he's. I don't know. He hasn't popped up again or anything. I'm not sure. We might have to re bring him back on again. Um, but um, what were the reasons that people were leaving and were they getting disillusioned? And, you know, was what, what, what was that? I mean, as much as you can share. Yeah. I mean, definitely everybody had this idea of this big money we were supposed to get. Um, of course, in music, you just think you, you know, you as a musician or artist you 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 the person that's that's getting paid and you don't realize you're the last person to get paid 
Right. So that that started going on, and the talk in the streets about Mr. Fenwick, you know, which everybody got an idea of, of you know, Charlie being crooked, and and so you live in this life, and you you at these shows, and and you these people looking at you, and everybody think you got money, and then you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, acting like you got money, doing whatever you're doing out here, right? And so then that get old. And I, I think mainly money. I'm thinking about Saquon, uh, money, you know, Ricky. I think it was pretty much the same thing with everybody. So and, was, um, it, was it money from the albums that, that was the problem, or was it money from the shows that was the problem, or both? I think it's both. I mm -hmm. think it was both. Um, I know for me, in 97, whenever I went to start playing with Funk, I really started noticing, and, and let me just say in the beginning, way before we were supposed to get paid, I was walking around, y'all ain't putting no money in my pocket, and I just had this attitude, right? And they kind of got cut me and, uh, you know, let me cool off, and, I, you know, I ended up coming back because I knew it was going to be big. Well, I figured it would be big, and, and, and you know, I missed playing with, with the homies, and so this was early, but then so once, you know, I came back, I got quiet, I got quiet. and so I'm just hanging in there, hanging in there, but once I started playing with Prop, proper utensils with funk and on the break i'm getting i'm getting my check in cash and it's more than the hug of us might have got for virginia state maybe a, a pier one in richmond and you know maybe two colleges or a couple venues clubs and a college one show with funk on the break i'm getting paid or at the end of the show more than i was getting paid with the hug of us so that became very confusing to me right even understanding that Charlie had to pay for hotel rooms. We had roadies. We had, you know, uh, Roy. We had different things to take care of. We going, we got to eat. Um, even understanding that, it still seemed like the that we were just, it was just a little short. That's as far as the show money. Right. And with the royalty check, of course, this was all new at that time. I don't know, know, know anything about it. But, yeah, it just seemed like it was money on the table. And then it was talk in the street with different people that was even around and when Charlie, you know, uh, you know, different people that you, that knew both parties may mm -hmm. have been a little older or not, you know, and you would just hear stuff. And I think it just got the best of, of some of, of some of us, you know? So what was the, what was the arrangement uh, real quick for those, anybody that's on uh, Instagram, make sure you head over to youtube.com slash go, go tick. There's only about a minute left on Instagram. It's going to cut off. Uh, so it's, it's pinned in the, uh, pinned in the comments, youtube.com slash go, go ticks. Um, so uh, what, uh, oh, somebody said, uh, uh, or they wanted me to try to bring Ty in, but unfortunately, as you know, this is not like Instagram or Facebook where I can't, I can't just add a you know yeah, a, yeah. A process to bring them in. So sorry, but but Ty, we'll try to get you on a on a future episode or something like that. Um, but uh, I forgot what I was about to ask you talking about that, but it's okay. But um, I don't know what the hell was I about to ask you? It's about the, the process. What's that? You was about to say something about the process. I was talking about uh, the show money and. Oh, I remember what it was. Yeah. So it was like, what? So what's the pro? Like, how did how did you guys know how much you were supposed to get paid? Was it just like at the, you know, like was it a certain amount per show, or was it um, just okay? Here's what you guys get this week, or how you know how? Right. No, it was never like it was never. Um, drawn out like we never kind of knew it was it would fluctuate mm -hmm. and yeah. that was the thing it was never clear and and you know charlie would would say different things i don't know if mistakenly you know i know how much a deposit is for virginia state so you telling me then that, that, that what was the right you know what i'm saying deposits usually have for a certain percentage and so if i know how much the deposit is because you didn't talk you know you didn't you didn't got you know you might be mad and, and say certain stuff and, it, and, you know, it just never equated, but we never knew, you know, what was the set fee for a, a black hole show or a, a in town show or a college show or, you know, depending on the venue. I, we never knew that. We just know we coming back and this is the money and sign this paper. Right. You know, and like that's what, so when I start playing with funk, I know I'm getting this much a show every time. 
So you were so you were playing with proper utensils at the same time you were playing with Hucklebucks, or this was afterwards that you realized? Yeah, it? yeah. This was during it. This was during oh, okay. it. it was like at the end. This was my uh, exit from the Hucklebucks. After I couldn't put up with so much of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing it from both sides, um, especially with uh, Saquon being gone and Ricky being gone, and we got to, you know, it just wasn't the same. Right. I mean, of course, in hindsight. I, I probably would have did some stuff different. Like me and Charlie talk, like we really talk now. And he's made stuff clear to me, you know, about his cost and some of the stuff he was doing behind the scenes and just understanding from starting my own bands later and, and understanding cost. Um, you know, I look at some of the stuff I was, I was beefing about and it, uh, you know, it's not all uh, true. It's not all uh, warranted, but at the same time, I think it was still some money on the table. Um, so so, I want to really dig into that because that's, this is really pertinent to, you know, a lot of uh, go go organizations. So you mentioned, uh, yeah, I know Ricky was here for one second and he <laughs> went out again. Uh, but um, you mentioned that you you had started, you know, bucking the system a little bit. And you mentioned that you had some, you know, some issues that, and thoughts with the money. But then you gained some clarity on those things later on. Can you talk specifically about what some of those things were? And, you know, you don't have to get too far into detail. But I, what, I'm, what I want is for somebody that's in a band to maybe just have a different perspective. You know, because me, I've obviously I've been in bands and I've managed bands and I've booked bands and, I, you know, what I'm saying all that I had a record label, all that. So I understand all of the sides of it. So. Right it makes sense to me but if i'm only ever just played an instrument it may not make sense to me and so that's right. why that's what part of the reason of this show is is to try to illuminate some of that kind of stuff and i get frustrated sometimes because i'm like yo this shit is on the internet it's not like it's right. a secret. you know what i'm saying but uh, but at the same time like you know uh, rather than being mad about it let me just try to be a resource you know to to try to you know, shed some light on that. So what, uh, you know, any, any clarity you can bring on that, I think would be hopefully extremely helpful to people, uh, you know, that are in bands and maybe going through some of the same things I'm saying, you know, well, I'm not getting paid them enough or stuff like that. So anything you could share would be really helpful. Right. Um, like even all the way down to the tax ID and, and if you want to start it, get your LLC, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that that's money, that's time, that's know how. So that, for that, mm -hmm. Uh, you got to pay for rehearsals if you don't have uh, a basement. If you have a basement, you got to have equipment in there, the right speakers, and you yep. got to pay for electric. I mean, I mean that's just simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also stuff that band members don't think about. Don't think about, right. Yeah, you so, know, I mean, when I started Mumbles, I, I paid for rehearsals for like the first three years, and it's like, you know, you never even get it back. Like they no. never even think about it. Like they don't even, uh, it doesn't even occur to them who's paying for this. You know right. what I'm saying? And so, so like that, like, let's take that for instance. You paid for rehearsal for three years. So when Mumbo saw start making money, you can go back if you, you know, if, if, you got the right to go and collect all those rehearsals, whether it's show by show, you know what I mean? And yep. so I realized later that's maybe why we weren't getting all our money. But mm -hmm. he it just like, let me see the books. If, if everybody knew what was happening, then mm -hmm. we would probably be cool with it. But you know, you're young, you don't know. So you just like, rebellious but uh something like that for instance um you know and the manager uh, uh creator the founder of the band might take that loss and that's fine too but just to know that there is a cost there um yeah. so that's one thing and in the huggerbuck situation i'm pretty sure roy battle uh costs a pretty penny right funky ned like you bring it in production uh yeah. or if you're in a band and maybe somebody's producing the songs or writing that that's that could be a fee you got costumes or, you know, the t-shirts, you got promotion, uh, mm -hmm. social media, I'm trying to think about now, you right. have to, uh, somebody's got to run those pages or uh, ads or blogs, uh, these things have cost. Yep. So to get to get it jumping, whoever started it is gonna have to put in money. And you know, we know some bands, we break down the payments uh, for, for rehearsals, but mm -hmm. that's usually it. The, the band, the most of the musicians not seeing the cost of what it takes to gas this van up, to even have a van to take yep. the Hucklebucks out of town. I got to yep. gas it up. I got to uh, wait for you all late. If we messing up, then the band member's late, so the money getting docked. So yep. that's a, a, a loss. Then you got to get, you know, to the to the show. You got the food, and that was in our case. We had roadies. 
The roadies mm -hmm. used to laugh, Fish and Greg, we be on a on a uh, van talking about them. Y'all some roadies, they be like, yo, but get, get paid. Right. Shit like that, right? Cause, it, <laughs> yeah, cause the musician right. and the yeah. artist is the last to get paid. Yep. The, the person on that show, so when Beyonce do that show with all them lights and power techniques and, and super boards and, and tracked mm -hmm. out and the, all that, she, she, she got to pay for that. And so yep. after all that, then she get her money and she yep. might take a loss. <laughs> so, I mean, of course we yeah. know she not. Yeah, but mm -hmm. so just understanding that the artist is the last to get paid was big for me and, and you know, not holding a grudge against Charlie, like, and just understanding, like I said, and going through it myself with band members. Um, but yeah, all the costs that's incurred doing this, it's a lot, studio, the speakers, uh, like I got a studio, you mm -hmm. know, I deal with the rappers forever and you know, you rap about all this money, but you come in here and you want to lowball me or not pay me. I did you, I did the beat. You want the beat for free. You know, you want, you want me to record you. Then you yeah. want me every time you lose it, you want me to send it to you. Give me, you know, these type yeah. of things. I know we talking about go, go, but yeah, you know, yeah, so, so. Somebody posted the other day, uh, what was it? Uh, rappers will beg for a ride to the studio to go rap about, uh, <laughs> the <or> bag. Yeah. <laughs> racks. I got racks, Mo. Yeah. So look, so party. So, so very, very uh, pertinent question to what we're talking about right now. Party mode live media wants to know in your experience, do you think if Charlie wasn't the manager and you guys could have done it your way, do you think he would have had equal or greater success? Nope. Okay. And that's, I don't. Right. And I, and I hate this. I, I mean, of course it's not true in every single, uh, what's up, Marty? Uh, it's not, uh, true in every single scenario, but uh -huh. generally speaking, the the manager or the you know band leader visionary whatever it is you know it, it it always seems to happen that the band thinks that you know once a once a band starts to become successful and i can say yeah. from yeah. personal experience as i'm sure you know once a band right. starts to become successful they start to forget all the shit that happened that made them successful and the people that were doing all the work to make them successful and seem to think that it's just because they're the greatest and most yeah. Musicians and songwriters and performers in the world, and nine times out of ten, what happens is when that person that created the project or managed the band or did, you know did those things goes away, the band goes away. Everything goes away. Of course, yeah. we had we had mutiny plans. We was gonna leave Charlie about three times. We gang yeah. it up, but and, and not so much Charlie. Definitely his his knowledge and his connections, um, his vision. Like I talk to Charlie to, to this day and he'll break something down so simple. And it's just amazing. Even though, you know, he's a little outdated as far as the internet, it's still, you, you know, you can, you could just equate it to now. And it's yeah, just, it's, 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 I love talking to Charlie now. I, mean, I always did. He's like my rich dad, poor dad. He was like my rich dad in the entrepreneur sense. Not that my dad is poor. For but, sure. um, I but get it Roy, multiple times. Yep. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. But Roy and Ned, I mean, and mostly Roy, Ned early. Cause Ned, you know, just left us with things that made us able, you know, as far as the, what we did as a band, but mm -hmm. Roy was definitely, um, pertinent and everything. And, but the, with, that came with Charlie. So mm -hmm. Charlie knew to have Roy there to make everything what it was supposed to be. Well, that's you part know. of, that's part of the a manager's job. Yeah. Is to build exactly. Make exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's what's up, man. So, okay. So you leave Huckabucks, uh, you are, and and it, and correct me if I'm wrong. You said it was mainly because of the money wasn't adding up, right? And so you are still playing with proper utensils after you love talking about. Yeah, sure. For a brief stint. Okay, and then what'd you do? Uh, through proper utensils, uh, scooter, saxophone player I used to play with EU mm -hmm. was playing with uh we were we were all playing with proper utensils at udc one day we were sitting in the bleachers and he was talking about the r&b band he was starting and i was hanging with stomp dog and he was playing with an r&b band i'm just like, i want to play r&b now so um top 40 band so mm -hmm. i got with soul patrol mm -hmm. and started playing with them and it was the same type of thing we practiced for three or four months before we ever hit hit the stage yep. and i did that for five or six seven years one and all and mm -hmm. i was pretty much I, when I stopped, I did a couple shows with Backyard, played with Optimistic Tribe, maybe a show uh, after hours. You know, I did a couple things in, in the interim of that, but Soul Patrol and the Hugglebucks was my longest 
tenures that I, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that was the Soul Patrol was a whole nother, especially after coming from funk, learning things from funk about like, I mean, down to the hi hat, you know, how I go go open the hi hat and it's way open, it's just making yep. noise. So yep. learning how to 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 have it halfway open, you know, for for effect or you know, but never all the way open with funk. Um, you know, funk got he's just strict uh, with everything. Okay. Speaks, yeah, it speaks to that. What, what are the, what would you say the top three things you learned from funk work? All right, so that was one, uh, bringing the, bringing the volume down without bringing the intensity down when verses come in. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was important and hard to learn because when you, when you, when you quiet down, you make you slow down. Right. And so that was that, you know, that's the natural so, reflex. So, so, so dynamics without dynamics. Without the tempo yeah right the, so, the intensity yeah mm -hmm. uh that that was the main thing main things with him of course being on time well i was always pretty much on time I'm trying to think what was the you are, you are the other thing you are corn in this business for that yeah especially <laughs> as a drummer but i felt like as a drummer i should be on time that's important because i'm i'm important yeah, you're the backbone of the band. Yeah. Which is a is a bad flip too, knowing you're important. Look, you could you could uh you could stir stuff up like that too. I try not to take it the other way. Yeah. <laughs> but um so that and just understanding um uh, funk is magical. Like that Bama is a is a is a it was amazing. Like he just bind me up funk just watching him work a crowd. So that mm -hmm. would be the other thing, coming early. I mean, even like as a lead talker or a conductor or a MC, and he would come in there and, you know, talk to the people in the crowd and, and get all these things up there with his eyes closed and know all the anniversaries and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. just whining and warming to show up to a point. And uh, so I learned that from him, like that DJ, that mentality he got. Yeah. So just the, the, the structure and form and uh, what to do when mm -hmm. was what I learned from sitting behind him. That was that was a big thing. Really cool. magical. When did you start getting into production? Was it like ninety nine, about ninety nine. I bought my first, you know, EPS or whatever uh, sequencer, and me mm -hmm. and Carlos from the Hugglebucks would uh, make beats. We started making beats together, and so just off and on through through from that time to now, uh, then hanging with like the Scrapers rap group and you know different uh rap groups and you know just because production mostly i was i was doing a lot of rap rap beats because i'm a drummer i didn't really had the keyboard chops and, and things like that to you know i wasn't really in the r b um but so just more so on the rap side and over time i, I might have dealt with more r b and start picking up guitars and basses and uh you know getting getting better on the keys and learning more theory uh -huh. and this is really more later 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 Cause I was still playing in bands at that time. So production was just really on the side. And uh, so with that came engineering and buying my own equipment and learn how to engineer and, you know, making tracks and maybe not having an artist. So I'm gonna fill it up. So learning how to write and rap and, and all that. This is like a process of, from necessity, I was learning to do these different things over time. And, yeah. and more and more just feeling like the drums was cool, but uh, now I could do this or, with production back to what we were saying earlier this could take me up out of here quicker than me playing you know at, at the black hole every friday this production maybe could take me out of here or even uh enhance what i'm doing here with gogo -Go bands like maybe this production maybe i could learn to help make gogo -Go better with the production which you know well, yeah that that brings me to a point that i brought up a couple of times in, uh, throughout the series because i noticed a pattern of um of guys in gogo -Go or in, and ladies in gogo -Go who sort of have this well i'm playing in the band to make a little money but really i'm working on my r b career or my hip-hop career or something like that so it's almost like gogo -Go is like the stepchild you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah my question is why do you why is what where does that mentality come from why doesn't somebody say I'm going to put the energy that I'm focusing on this hip hop or this R&B stuff. And I'm going to put it into this Gogo -Go project that I'm doing. And we're going to make Gogo -Go that is as good as the R&B mm -hmm. and hip hop. 
that we're listening to and that we're trying to make. Why do you think right. that doesn't happen? Uh, cause people probably just don't believe really in go, go having that potential or, uh, maybe the personnel, like we were saying, the closeness of your band members, maybe at that time, at that time I was playing with soul patrol. So I wasn't really playing go, go, but I actually did incorporate my guitar and bass playing, you know, into my music, but just thinking like maybe how they be thinking, uh, maybe they don't see the potential. So it's like the band is a check. Cause it's here, it's right here, it's local while I'm trying to fly on out. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I do now though. I'm, I'm, I'm what you're saying. I'm trying to take all my skills and abilities I learned through those travels and put it into good go-go songs. Gotcha. But I'm all I'm kind of by myself. Well, I got my, my homies back the other day. There you go, Rick. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's, let's try this again. All right. Let's go. Let's go to, uh, to my man, Rick. All right. We're going to try to get, uh, you know, we didn't talk this whole time. You know, you got your cricket wireless going on over there. So we're going to try to um, try to uh, try to get some of your story in here. So we we talked about like, where do we leave off with you? We left off with you when you started with the Huckabuck. So I guess, I mean, without being on here for another hour, my, and because of the um, nature of this show, what and and the purpose behind the show is not just to get the story but it's to figure out what things were done right what things were done wrong and what things can we look at as instructional for other people to do a better job coming after us you know what i'm saying so when you think about the huckabucks and why you left why did you why did you leave and 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 chief you mentioned that you know he left for a specific reason and then sort of got clarity on what those reasons were later on in life. And maybe it still didn't all the way add up, but what was your experience with, with leaving? And, uh, well, okay. So my situation, the reason that I left, um, is be, uh, because it, it was, I wasn't able to support my family. I had just gotten married. Well, I didn't even get married yet, but I just uh, had a son mm -hmm. and, um, uh and 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 it the 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 money wasn't coming in at a at a good enough rate where i could sustain my family you know what i'm saying so then that coupled with um you know what i'm saying uh i had a um you know i had to question certain things you know on, on a religious standing like you know what i'm saying i was really getting uh you know closer to god and everything and 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 figuring all that out you know what i'm saying and realizing you know, now I realize, you know what I'm saying, you can you can still do music, you know what I'm saying, you can still do music, it's just the what you say and what you do, you know, behind it or whatever, to, you know, so that it's not, you know, uh, raunchy or whatever, you know what I'm saying, but um, the reason that the Hucklebucks didn't curse, you know, that we were so like a clean band because I didn't curse at all, you know what I'm saying, I didn't mm -hmm. curse on anything and, and um, that's kind of what one of the uh, one of the selling points on getting us played on the radio and everything, because everything I was writing didn't have any cursing and, and all that. Right. But, um, but but I end up I end up leaving, you know, for for money reasons and um and just you know trying to make sure I can support a family. So um uh, my man Ray, uh, he, he he passed away. But um did I did I dip out? Did no I no no, you're good. I was just trying to I was just trying to uh figure out how to get a a view where it's got you uh got you big since you're talking and then I can yeah there you go okay keep going. Uh, uh, yeah, my man Ray from PA Palace, man, he passed away. But um, but he um, he ended up giving me a job. You know, we would talk about the monies and all that type of stuff and what was going on with the band. And uh, man, he kind he really helped me out. He really helped me get started. And he and he really had a a vision for me as well. He was like, you know, like you really talented, you should be doing something. So he actually was one of the first pe people to get behind me and uh. uh he wanted me to start being an artist again. He started me writing again. He bought me some equipment, paid for studio time, and I ended up doing a, like a little project with him that we never we never put out. But uh, but that that that's one of the reasons that I left because of the, the money situation. So question question for sort of for both of you did you did either one of you try to negotiate and say hey Charlie, uh, you know I I need this much to survive and to stick around or was it just like oh no you're getting over I'm out of here. Pretty much, uh, 
the law. Yeah, well, for me personally, yeah. I, yeah, go ahead, Chief. No, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I should bring up when we when we saw him in the studio that day. I don't know if he was even there. Uh, but we kind of approached him as a band with our parents and stuff. You know, we were still young. And mm -hmm. we, we, we approached him, you know, basically with we don't think it's fair, we should be getting more. Um, that didn't really turn into anything. Uh, but, yeah, I pretty much, yeah, I was just kind of out. I think I, um, and then I was dealing with the Saquon thing. I know I skipped out on on a, a, a college show that they had a, a deposit and everything on Icy Ice, and uh, Saquon was supposed to meet me there. We had a talk, and uh, he was supposed to be there, and he, he ended up bailing out, and I kind of just bailed out that day. I mm -hmm. think that was the last uh, hoorah for me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it was it was an all of a sudden thing for me. Gotcha. Go ahead, Rick. Oh, he's frozen again. Damn. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what we're I, gonna do. He we were in a studio the day. I don't know if this is accurate, but I got a pretty good memory, and we were recording a song for that. Uh, for the double CD, the uh, better move something. And it seemed like Rick came in and left. That was, you know, that was the last time I seen Rick. So I kind of think his was all of a sudden too. Gotcha. You know. well, the reason I ask is because I feel like um, just, you know, and, and I probably was the same when I was young too, like knowing now what I knew or, or knowing right. then if I, what I knew now, I would, I would just calmly go yeah. and say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I right. think. What should be going on? Like, can we work yeah. something out? Can we make it happen? But it seems like the knee jerk reaction in yeah. uh, in Gogo -Go is, man, fuck you, you fucking me over. You know, it's just a right. bunch of rah rah as opposed to just like having a conversation and trying to figure it out. And right. generally speaking, you know, that works. Sometimes it doesn't, but a lot of times yeah. it does. And I feel like if I was Charlie, if everybody came to me with their parents right. rah rah and ganging up on me, I probably would have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, you know, I would have been like, oh, hold up. You know, that's, that's just what happened. But Ricky yeah. did actually, like he just said, he said, uh, Charlie, I got a family. You mm -hmm. know, he, he came to him. I think he did come to Charlie personally. Like, look, I'm, I'm going to raise this family. And, you know, and Charlie just, you know, didn't concede. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he wasn't happy about Ricky working at PA Pilots. He felt like they was using his image to, to, to sell, you know. So that might have been Charlie's response. Right. So he's probably like, okay, I'm gone, man. Like I'm, they give him, I'm getting paid a consistent check here, and you talking about them using my image, like just because I'm Ricky. For, and they probably did. They probably did get people yeah, coming to college. But at the end of the day, that that's, that has nothing to do with the other. Right. Exactly. In my mind. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, uh, so Alfonso has a question. What was the situation with Saquon? What I, um, what happened? I know he passed away, but I don't know the story either. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, what led to it, but he he was shot at his house. Mm -hmm. um, he was out there, something with uh, a chick he was dealing with. I mean, I don't know if it's, that's how, you know, I know he was out there talking to a chick because she got shot too. Or, oh, and wow. he was like, there was at a cookout at his, at, his, at his house in Mitchellville, and some dudes just pulled up and shot him in the driveway he had like a caddy or something and he kind of pulled off and ran into a house across the street mm -hmm. and you know we just heard about it on the news and you know it was kind of like a shock right so then i don't think they found who did it and no we don't know the why mm -hmm. i talked to his mother not too long ago about trying to open up the case and maybe doing some documentary stuff you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. to see to see if that that'll shed some light on it make them make them open it up because you know how it is in, in, in pg county in dc with my uncle murdered especially something that old right and of course i didn't you know back then i didn't think of nothing but now with the internet and cameras and me having access i kind of reached out to her on maybe trying to get her some closure because right you know she, she's still pretty upset about it and um and some of the stuff she told me and stuff just started coming out and I kind of even got a little names and, and and faces and things she was telling me that I wasn't even uh aware of mm. 
you know, that, and that kind of got a little sticky for me. You know, to just uncover stuff that, or, or dig up some stuff that, you know, and I kind of fell back off that idea. Oh, I got you. you. I yeah, got so I, I don't know what happened, man. I just, this was 2000, I think September 2000. Yeah, he uh, got killed. Yeah. Gotcha. So this was after all the band stuff was pretty much over, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, RIP for sure. So Ed uh, Ed Snipes says, uh, back, and sort of back to what we were talking about earlier, was um, how did you determine your market value? Um, well, Ed, just to clear up, no, we're, we're not talking about the time when they were coming to their own. We're talking about the time when they were red hot. Um you know, they were smoking the hottest band in the city, not making any money. Um, but he is correct in what he's what he's saying, which is how did you determine your market value? Uh, you don't get paid based on your personal needs, which is 100 percent correct. But I think it's it's difficult from a it, it's difficult from a from a band member perspective, because I didn't really learn how to price a band until you know, maybe the last 15 years or so, you know what I'm saying? Certainly well after I was uh, dealing, you know, like playing for go-go bands. And so I think most musicians don't really know. And there's, and it, and, and the, the, it's only a rule of thumb. There's no exact science to, to setting up right. upon a band, but roughly speaking, it's, you know, for a live performance, it's roughly, um, 60% of the gross. So for example, if you, if you a thousand dollars comes in the door to see your band, uh, you know, and you're hired by a promoter or hired by a venue rule of thumb is you're worth about 600 bucks. You know what I mean? So, right. but as an individual band member, and when you guys were having the issues, um, is how much of that should trickle down to you as the drummer and also taking into consideration, all of the, um, you know, taking into consideration all of the, you know, expenses that we talked about earlier. Um, so, okay. So, so Ed says, Ed is a, is a, just so you know, he's like a, uh, he's like a start shit type of dude. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 I think I know. Yeah. I yeah, I yeah, know yeah. He was, but yeah. No, I, I think I know what he's talking about. So, um, cause he's talking about, we were still opening. And that yep. was kind of crazy too in hindsight, you know, just uh, maybe even then, but just talking to Charlie later. And Charlie used to always say the brackets, right? He'd be like, well, Essence charged 35 to 55 and Backyard charged this and that. And, you know, and there was these brackets that we fit in. Like, I'm going to get y'all up to y'all at 800. I'm trying to get y'all to 1500 or 2500. This right. is in town. This ain't college. Right. right. You know, that's a whole nother pay, pay grade. But um, yeah. so he would tell us these things. Like I said, he would throw out these numbers and then when the money wasn't added up, it, it would be confusing. Right. And, um, but, and then, so the opening up thing, when we was the red hot hugger when it seemed like we could have went off and did our own shows and we might've did a prophecy, a little club here and there. But when we, when I think we should have tried to do our own IBEX night or maybe not even the IBEX, something we could have, you know, made look good or met or something. Right. But mm -hmm. he wasn't doing it. And he kind of like towards the end, he wanted to, to put us on, on the IBEX on a Wednesday when we played and kept us on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's when we recorded that album. It was on a Wednesday. And mm -hmm. we were getting 83 and 96 people. And the week that we, we did the recording, everybody knew it was a recording. So we got a 300 or something in there for that mm -hmm. one day to do the recording. But mm -hmm. I think that he, he mishandled us in that sense where we could have um, started at a different time. To, to, to I mean, of course, he didn't know it was about to be over, right? I mean, right, I right. Right. Sure. but it just seemed like when we was at that point, he might have should have branched off, but I think, and, and in my mind, my mind then, I was like, okay, so he getting enough money for us to come right up on the back at the black hole or up on the junkyard at the Ibex. He's getting enough money that he comfortable and could keep it going. And so almost like why S's don't go play in Utah? Cause he's like, you comfortable, you could charge more here, right? So I think he was kind of in that slot where he was getting a nice little bit of money and didn't want to take the risk of losing money with us on our own night. And then I think he waited too late. So right. that he was yeah, that piece of two two extremely uh, important points, which is timing, uh, and yeah. and and also, um, you know, the the extremely low tolerance for risk that GoGo has right. sort of adopted over you know over the time period that it's been around, and because it's. Um, 
because you can make a decent amount of money just playing in DC a few nights a week, but you can never make real money for a few nights right. a week in, in DC. And that's the, that's the, the frustration that I've always had is that every, almost every single musician that I've ever talked to, and I've talked to way more than I've interviewed on this show. The reason I started this show is because I had these phone conversations. Right, with right. All the time. I get it. I might as well just put them on a fucking internet and let other people watch it. Almost every single one of them. Matter of fact, I can't think of one that I've, a person I've ever talked to that just said, I'm just happy playing in DC. Right. Every single one of them says, man, and I think maybe it's because of what what they you know later on now that they know what I did with Marvel Sauce and what my agenda yeah. that they feel like maybe I have some kind of special insight onto how to press some right. a magic easy button and make you a national star. There is no magic easy button. The, the, right. You have to you have to take a risk. You have to go yeah. into a market where you have no value and you have to play and build up your value in the market in the same exact way that you played and built up your market in DC when you started. Right. Playing. So, so go ahead. I always had this vision, like what if backyard red essence junkyard, uh, you know, new impressions, whatever is now uh, TCB, right. UCB. Mm -hmm. Cause they, you know, like these bands got a following it's, it's, it crosses the gamut of demographics. What if all of, all of these bands, got together like the, some of the hip hop artists, the Def Jam, Rock the Mic tour. And, and even if it was just the East Coast tour, uh, every so-and-so just to test the waters and and took out a tour and marketed it, all that powerhouse of those bands could just go. And I think that would just spread. I think that could make a lot of noise, but the problem is the risk is like, I mean, a lot of people got jobs and stuff because it's this it's, it's, it's go goes the stepchild. But yep. if, if if that could happen, because we talk about what, what some of the things that could uh, make it, you know, could be a, a good catalyst for taking it national. And I thought about that after after my, I gave you my answer. But what do you think about that? Like if 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 it was like the top fans that could, you know, and you might lose a little money, you might not be able to charge the same door prices, but the power that that would have, I think, could could really make an imprint. I think that in theory, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah, of course, sir. I think that in reality and uh, practic practically speaking, ego. Uh, there, are, there are a myriad of issues with that. One is, yes, egos. Um, play first. <laughs> to getting to, uh, you know, having those bands understand that you can't charge the same. And this is the other thing that I've brought up a bunch of times on this show is that I think that because most of Gogo's experience with playing out of town is playing mm -hmm. at colleges and or playing at things like the Miami Takeover and those type of events where you're really just transplanting a bunch of people from DC into another market. Right, you right. Got college kids that are from DC that want to hear the music from home. You're not yeah. promoting Gogo -Go to people that live in North Carolina and are from North Carolina or people in live in Miami and work in Miami. And you know what I'm saying? So new crowd, yeah. Right. So that's a very different concept from being a touring band, which your job is to go out and to convert people that live in that town or that city to become fans of your band. And right. so what happens is Gogo -Go bands have been trained because colleges pay more money. And the reason that colleges pay more money is because colleges are not dependent upon ticket sales. They're not, they're not, tr colleges aren't trying to make money. They have a, I used to be the, by, you know, the, the assistant concert director at my college, you have a budget of a certain amount of money that's mm -hmm. given to you for a semester and you have to spend all that money or else it just goes away and you can do whatever you want with it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, not whatever you want, but basically, so there's a lot more money there because the, 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 the agenda is different. A college is not trying to be profitable off of your show. A college right. is provide entertainment for their students and there's money set aside to do that you know what i mean yeah. so but what happens is gogo -Go bands because they're not as educated in the way the business works and the touring industry works um it which is part of the reason for this show is to try to get this information out there is they think that they get trained that if i go out of town i'm supposed to get more money because right. i have to get a babysitter and i have maybe right. i have and, I, and maybe I have to get a hotel room and maybe I have to do all this. Maybe I have to do all that. Well, that's not how it works in touring. 
You know what I mean? You don't get you. You get paid in the same way as what Ed was just saying earlier. You get paid what you're worth, which means right. and it doesn't happen every time. Sometimes you get over. Sometimes you get screwed. And it, you know, right. whatever. But basically, it is you are paid roughly, you know, if you're dealing with a promoter that is really does this for a living and it's not just like somebody's cousin that won the lottery and wants to throw a show, <laughs> roughly speaking, you're worth about 60% of whatever you can bring in the door. You know what I mean? But bands think that I get paid $2,500 in DC. So if somebody wants me to go to Atlanta, I got to pay for my hotel rooms and my car, you know, my rental car and, you know, the band member is going to want more money than what they want in DC. So I can't go to Atlanta because, or wherever Miami or whatever, because it costs too much. Right. But what, what, what bands and other genres do and rappers and every other genre of music there is that plays shows and clubs is they go and they, they realize that I'm going into a new market where nobody knows who I am. Right. So, I, most likely, even if I get paid $5,000 in my hometown, if I go to a city, you know, two states away, I'm if I've never played there before, I'm probably going to have to play for a door deal, which means if 10 people come to see me play, which is probably what's going to happen because nobody knows who the fuck you are, right. we're not going to make any money. We're going to lose money. And that is what you call running a business. And that is what you yeah. call marketing cost, you know, right. Trying to convert those people into fans to right. make more money. Yeah. Later. And you have to go, you have to go and play there and you play there for 10 people. And then you keep in touch with those 10 people and you try mm -hmm. to turn them into the fans. And the next time you go, you hope that it's 50 people and maybe you right. get 500 bucks this time. And then the next time you go back, then hopefully that 50 people, maybe you got a hit song, you know, that is playing in that market. Or now you don't have to worry about it playing in the market anymore because you have Spotify, which, and mm -hmm. Apple plays everywhere. So you don't right. have to worry about the radio as much. And so GoGo -Go is operating off of a system that one is like nowhere else in the world can a band play three times a week in the same right. Band, right. And in the same, right. much less the same venue and definitely not for $50 a head because that's a right. con ticket. You know what I'm saying? So and still get people though. Right. And so and so you are you are in a in a in a totally unprecedented situation, which if bands realized that and said, OK, this is not how it works everywhere else. So I need to adjust my strategy for how I do things here and adjust it to work for how things work elsewhere. Then we would have much, but, you know, and I'm taking a long ass time to answer your question and, you know, I'm supposed to be asking you the questions, but this is important, I think. So yeah. we're talking about, you know, all of those bands that you mentioned. Now the managers may understand it and they may get right. it. And, you know, you, I'm, I'm, I'll, I would venture to say that Big G gets it because mm -hmm. he's doing, uh, he does other shit outside of just go-go. So he has a broader spectrum mm -hmm. of knowledge of, you know, of how things work in different circumstances. But most, of, but the drummer, you know, and I, I don't want to say the drummer because you're a drummer, and I don't. No, know. it's cool. I get it. Talking about buggy, but you know what I'm saying? Just just using using the drummer. Buggy, buggy actually gets it too, but yeah, I got. Yeah, it. no, no, yeah, that was a bad example because he definitely gets it. But yeah, so just you know, random drummer out of mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, or the bass player or the right. power player or whatever keyboard player, whatever. Generally speaking, they're not operating with that level of information. They're not operating with that level of um, insight into how the business works and usually not that level of dedication to what they're doing because right. most band, like I said earlier, Gogo -Go is the stepchild. So most guys that are playing in bands are just doing it for a little bit of fun to have a little bit of fun on the weekends or we'll get some girls, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever it yeah. is. Um, or, you know, relive their, their teenage years or whatever. So taking that type of risk and saying, I'm going to drive to, Cleveland, Ohio to make zero money to right. put five people is just generally not what your average go-go musician is going to be willing to do. And so even if you're talking about all of those bands and that is what you would need, mm -hmm. you would need everybody within that tour to be on that page to right. understand that we're doing something bigger than 
like it's very hard for musicians and this is not just go, go, this is just period. Very hard for musicians to think of shows as part of a bigger picture, as opposed to how much I getting paid for this show. Right. Versus how does doing this particular show play oh, sure. overall yeah. strategy of what we're trying to do? You know what I mean? Right. So that's the problem I think you would fall into. You would, so basically what would happen is you would go to promoter. I would go to a promoter in New York. I would go to a promoter in Miami. I would go to a promoter in Atlanta. And I would say, I want to bring this tour to your room. Hey, that's dope. I watched that documentary on TV one. Um, yeah, that would be, that would be cool. How many tickets do you think you can sell? Well, in Atlanta, if you're only talking about people in Atlanta, you know, probably, Five to five hundred to seven hundred tickets. Okay, well, what? Uh, how much? Let me let me do some quick math here. All right, well, how much do you think the tickets could be? Okay, F so you sell five hundred tickets at twenty dollars. That's ten thousand dollars total, right? Right. So if you take all of the bands, you say, okay, that's worth sixty sixty percent. So that's six thousand dollars, right? Now, 500 tickets, if if you brought those bands down to Miami and sold 500 tickets to people that live in Miami, that's a fucking hell of a yeah. flag to plant in the ground. However, if you're talking about $6,000 for five bands to go to Miami. Forget about it. It's a non-starter right there. You know what I'm saying? Because none of them are thinking about it in terms of let's develop a fan base for go, go in Miami. And then right. you had like my man, Wiley, who does the, the, the Miami takeover, who he's, he's, I'm not saying there's no people from Miami there. I think he, you know, he has right, right. both places. So he's trying to cross collateralize as much mm -hmm. as possible. But I think the, if I'm not mistaken, the lion's share of the yeah. people that come that, that pay the bill for backyard and, you know, DJs and vibe band or whoever to do the Miami takeover is people that are coming from DC. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's yeah. the only difficulty that I see. Although in theory, yes, that would great, you know, that would a hundred percent make sense. But yeah, so party live media says basically the same thing. Gogo hasn't done enough nationally for a successful tour. It possibly could work if you toured HBCUs or maybe East coast, which is what you were talking about. Anything West would have a hard time succeeding a hundred percent. You're right. But even the East coast, I mean, it's still, you're still talking about a, a huge thing and none of the bands have figured out how to make records. So I want to pivot to that. And we've already been on here for an hour and 45 minutes. So I won't go too long, but um, from your production standpoint, because I want to talk about, uh, well, I want to talk about real quick, your time in Atlanta. And then I want to talk about your, the, the go-go loops and what your vision for that is. So when did you go to Atlanta and why did you go to Atlanta and why did you come back? 2012, I went down. Rick been trying to get me to come down there since he went pretty much to uh, play with XO, mm -hmm. you know, to just try to do the go-go thing down there. Mm -hmm. um, just took me a minute to finally get there. And like we said earlier, uh, I, I, I got there a little late. Um, and XO wasn't together. We started the band uh, off script when we brought Kari and oh, yeah. kind of members from XO. Yeah. So um, we, we recorded a, a project. Um, I ended up making a movie. Uh, I hung with a guy that was making a movie. Uh, but, and you know, we did some shows with the band. And, um, oh, and so that's kind of like where I really got the idea for Go Go Loops. I was doing, I had done some Go Go production on, on my MPC, but you know, it's really hard to get it to sound uh, like a drummer. Yeah. So uh, during that time and just kind of being down there on the island by myself um a couple things registered in my head uh and i wanted to i wanted to make some go-go and uh, i needed to make some money um so i bought a course from you know some producer you know everybody's just self-help and teaching and training and the guy was saying um you know just talking about different ways you can make money with production he was like i know you got beats on your computer why don't you take the stem and sell the guitar part or this and that you know that's a big market now just selling yep. samples and yep. so with that idea and then i was i had a guy that was kind of mentoring me i was in like a, a, a wake up now one of the multi-level marketing joints right mm -hmm. so hazik ali i don't know if y'all know hazik ali yeah i know i'm uh, tabby yeah. to be in a group with yeah, tabby, tabby, tabby yeah the cool yeah. kids yeah real real smart dude right 
And so we we outside talking one night. He was in the band with us. He was the rapper. And we talking. He like, Chief, you Chief from the Hugger Bucks. You got something nobody in the world got. Chief, you can do it. You know, because he, he sells and he all that. He's a motivator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now so, I watch some of his Facebook stuff. Yeah, he's he's. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, he he's a salesman, Jack. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> he uh, so with that sales stems and chief, you got something nobody in the world got. Mm-hmm. That's how I, I, I thought of GoGo Loop. Um, so I started my first little pack and the website. You know, I had to figure out how to do everything, mm-hmm. um, how to collect the money, and so I started that down there. And so I stayed to like 2015. The band thing uh, didn't work out. And mind you, I was playing congas in the band. Congo. I know we call them congos. Right. I was playing, I was, the correct yeah, I was playing congas. Learned mm-hmm. that from Funky Ned. I think uh, I can was playing drums at first, and uh, then Rio right. came down. Then I ended up running the one at the end. I just wanted to oh, really? say that. Oh, really? Yeah. You, I, you both just can't fucking decide what instrument you want to play, then, basically, is what it comes down to. Yeah, we kind of we had a group called Talented Psycho Entertainment. That was like our label. Well, mm-hmm. like a lot of the cats we dealt with was multi instrumentalist, if that's the word. Yep. And so, yeah, we kind of you know always been like that. Um, just getting better and better. And so I came back in 2015, mainly because my daughter was, had just went to high school. My oldest daughter, and she was like in 10th grade. And I just wanted to be home to to you know, be here for, for through those last couple of years because her mother died when she was young. So okay. she was like here with grandma. So I kind of wanted the daddy to be home. Hey, what you doing? Right, right. So <laughs> I came back with all intentions on on going back. Um or either like like we talking about to Cali. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I mean I love it. I love it. The DMV is cool, but it's just I just think um I can do you know, when you when you from a place, you become the, the usual. You regular. You not you don't stand out. So yeah. like even my drum, even as a go go drummer, of course they got world renowned drummers in Cali or Atlanta, but it's just something we do that's different. That's yeah. what kind of I feel like will make it special. Then I get down there and I don't even get to play drums. It's crazy. <laughs> but um, so you know, I definitely want to kind of get get back out of here, and I don't know if it's gonna be Atlanta, Atlanta or Cali, but I came back and um. 2015 and started working in a studio up here that bands was rehearsing that sounds a sway. So then I come right back into the go go mentality, all the bands. And like you say, they coming in the control room and we having these conversations every day and all these different go go legends and all these, you know. And I was just be like, man, we need to make a show about this with these stories and, you know, and these perspectives. And I just never got on to that, but I do appreciate it. I like I like what you're doing. And, um, yeah. Huh? I just said thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, oh yeah. But the, and so that's where I'm at, man. And just trying to expand on GoGo Loops. I uh got like nine different products, I think now. And then talk to everybody, the Jam and Jeffs, the Mickeys, the, the Buggies, and I want to definitely get them involved. Trying to figure out, you know, how to, you know, break it down and get everybody paid. Like I would love to have a GoGo Mickey kit and sample his real con his his Congos and the wow. Jam and Jeff kit. And you know, have loops and their samples as a drum kit, and have their samples. But I just kind of been doing stems that I found on my computer and stuff that that I got. I got stuff that maybe Stomp was on, some stuff we did in Atlanta. You know, little pieces of stuff. And so this is the thing with Go Go Loops, right? And I've been talking to people about it for years. It is crazy the Go Go mentality, right? Because we know most Go Go uh, tapes are public domain. There's no barcode. There's really no, you know. There's really no way that you can monetize it. Is that just like people can got online stores that that's not even in gold can sell their CDs, right? Yep. You can sell dynasty CDs and, and subtle thought and yep. nobody can do nothing about it. The PA Palace yeah. model, yeah. PA yeah. Palace, right. Yep. But me being of the culture and knowing these guys, I'm like, okay, I'll just talk to them and go in the studio and you know, get my own stuff. But we know that the certain PA takes got that edge. So, yep. you know, that's the, the one thing that um I'm still torn about. And I asked people, you think I could just like take a 95 back and just sell bug and sauce joints? And he was like, yeah, why not? Fuck it. I'm like, this, yeah, but that's my man's in there. And everybody I asked me like, nigga, you lunching, you better do that. And I'm still at a crossroads. I don't think I'm ever going to sell them because I do got some, but I got a pack I want to put out and I'm trying to figure out how to do it. I might just give it away because that way I'm not. That's what I, it, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, because I think yeah. that. 
I understand where you're, you're, you're right. Cause I would be in the same situation. I would feel a certain kind of way knowing that, you know, people do make money off of those things and, you know, but it's, but it's, but it's also baked into the culture. Like the way that, the way that the, the whole PA tape thing works is right. just like, you know, it just makes no sense, really. But, um, but, but who am I to exploit I, my brothers? <laughs> right, and I, and, and go go. Right, and I mean, even though that's what the, what's what it's been, you know, has worked this whole time. But I do think I think give it away for free because the, the yeah. like the the idea is to get it the out. Intention, the intention, right? Yeah, it's right. to get the attention. It's to get the it's to get people to start using it. You know what right. I mean? And once right. you use it, then that then you at that it's what they call a loss leader. It's just like how Best Buy used to sell CDs. They didn't make any money off of CDs. They just right. get you a store thing and buy a refrigerator. You know what I'm saying? Right. So right. It's, it's not even a loss leader. It's a it's a promotional item. You're like, hey, get this this loop with you know with buggy on it or whatever, and then you know buggy and sauce, and then but then if you want this other one, then that one costs money. You know what I'm right. saying? The one we took time and went in the studio and it's clean. And, right. you know, they get residuals or, or, or. and all that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So, or so then once you have some data, then you can say, OK, well, you know, I got 100 downloads of this free, you know, whatever buggy and sauce one. then, you know, go to go to Rasan or, you know, backyard or whatever and say, hey, you know, I want to cut a deal. Let's just I have this. Right. Story, do this and let's let's do some shit and split it 50 50 or whatever. And just make right. sure just like we were talking about earlier that the terms are negotiated up front and everybody and on paper and everybody's on the same page and you know it's just tough and in, in in this industry in the go-go industry because the business is done so you know in such a an informal way that right. and and the and the level of knowledge of how things work and how things are monetized in a you know in the greater industry is so low that you've always got somebody that's mad about something rather right than trying to negotiate and figure out something where everybody wins, you know? Right. And I, think that, I feel like that's a really big, and that's, I'm certainly not uh, innocent of that myself. Like I just, that, cause that's just how we came up, you know, that's yeah, yeah. how it was. Like, it was just like, Oh, if I don't like what you're saying, fuck you, let's fight, you know, right, or like, right, you, know, right. or, you know, whatever, as opposed to just being like, yo, let's do some business. Let's make some money. Let's figure out how this works for everybody. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. so, okay, so 1500 bar and grill is saying, uh, they, they need the loop. So I got it up on the screen. It's just go, go loops.com. You can't get any simpler than that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you, sir. Go, yeah, for sure. No, hundred percent. So go to go, go loops.com. If you are a producer, you want to uh, get some of the go, go sound. That's, that's where you go. So yeah. obviously it's a, it's a thing because kid, you know, kid Capri put out a, a packet too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, People obviously have a a uh, you know affinity for it now. The need, couple, yeah, yeah. Are most of the loops are they mostly like traditional crank ninety style Congos beats, or do you have like bounce beat stuff and breakdowns in there too, or is it mainly? Yeah, like bounce beat, uh, like drum kit sample. You know, live go go sound and drum kits as best I can do. Uh, I mean, it's it's high quality stuff. But you know, as an artist, I just always feel like I can do better. But I never got a complaint. Never got. I want my money back. But um, yeah, a lot of '90s stuff. I chopped up a Hucklebucks uh, one from the '90s from the Ibex. That's the most live, edgy sounding one. But most of the stuff is me on it. Um, and I got the MPC Crank 101 pack. That's the one I made on the MPC. But like, you cannot tell. Like, you think it's a drum and a Congo player. Um, oh. That's one. Of, that's the most expensive pack, but I think it's even worth more what I'm charging for. It. So okay. the, the, the CD I just did freestyle in the meanwhile, all those loops came from the MPC Crank 101 pack. And right. um, but yeah, I got different stuff, mostly drum kits. I got samples. I got Ty in there doing it. Yeah, come on. I got like the vo vocal thing. <laughs> okay. A couple guitar, you know, checks and the different things in there. But I, I'm just trying to get it to the level of um. Like I said, getting some of the major players involved, and mm -hmm. then I want to have some instructional type stuff. I got a lot of ideas. I ain't gonna say too much. I got some. I got some ideas. Okay. So, yeah, it's just right now. That's just where it stands. The, the samples, basically, samples, loops, and kits, and um, just me, just getting it started. Universal wasn't building in in, in ten years. Indeed, indeed. Well, so did you did you see? 
have you has have any like producers from other genres reached out to you about it or purchase that you know of? I mean, maybe you don't know. Maybe it's just like a Shopify store and you just see the name and don't know who they are. But yeah, but like with, even with the name, like one guy, Zombie Death Metal, this guy from London, he bought a couple packs, so we know what he's doing. And yeah. last month, I had a lot of sales in Alaska, strangely. But well, um, I'm ask you, how, did did you see a jump in sales after the documentary came out? Uh, I, I did, but I didn't know. I put my uh, I put the, that that little mixtape I just did out around the same time, oh, so okay. I, I wasn't sure. Which but one? I do try to I try to follow that, but it's the freestyle in the meanwhile came out. I think the same week I put it on YouTube. I never yeah. thought about that. I was thinking it was attributed to that, but it might have been. Even when they did the butt on the awards, right. you know, I'm looking at sales trying to see if it increased. And I get a lot of cats that's from here that move to another state, older cats, and they yeah. call me even. And man, I love what you're doing, and, you know. And, right. So I get a lot of calls. Like I got fans from Go Go Loops. Like, you know, I saw a guy in the mall. Are you Go Go Loops? It was almost <laughs> like Hugger Bucks. Like, because you know, you used to sign autographs. I don't know if people didn't know that. Like, the Hugger Bucks used to sign yeah. autographs. It was yep. pretty crazy. That was crazy too, like playing on the radio. But with Go Go Loops, it'd be surprising that people really, you know, like, like you know, appreciate it or whatever. But um, yeah, definitely different states. I, I, I haven't, you know, heard of many people from different genres that I know about. Most people are trying to do something with Go Go, but that's my idea. I want somebody from a whole different. A genre that don't understand the rules that we understand that's gonna speed yeah. it up and you know and just do something totally yeah. different. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Creative with it as opposed to just re, uh, re doing the same thing, I right? Over again. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people get the mixtape? Uh, it's on Tidal and Spotify and uh, Apple Music, every all the digital platforms. And what's that? What should they be searching for? It's a. It's just a freestyle. In the meanwhile. You might have to search. I, I just want just, to put it up on the screen. So oh, everything yeah. spelled correctly? Freestyle? Yeah. Me? Okay. So like, can you see it on the screen? Is that right? Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just a freestyle oh, in the meantime. Oh, it's just a freestyle. Okay. Let me, let me edit it real quick. And my name is Chief Ism. So that might help too. Cause and let's just do that. I'll do that because. Then yeah. And that'll, everything will come up. Else, then if there's anything else up there. So yeah. Chief Ism. So, okay, yeah. so go to Chiefism on Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, wherever you uh, stream your music and check out uh, check out the latest project. Hey, man, I appreciate you coming on and thank you uh, for, um, you know, holding it down because your, your partner <laughs> um, bailed out on you. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get Ricky back uh, when he's got when he's got a good uh, a strong uh, internet connection. But um, but yeah, man, thanks for thanks for holding it down. You you you're a pro at this, man. Like I could tell, as soon as as soon as his internet started messing up, like you immediately <laughs> got the next word and just carried on the story. So you you, yeah. you you held it down, man. So I appreciate it. But um, yeah, man, you you got my number now too. So hit me up anytime, man. Um. Uh, glad to hear you. You're you're keeping the dream alive, man. And uh, we'll see when you when you uh, come out to California. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, All right. man. Thanks everybody for watching. Appreciate it. Man. All right. All right. Peace. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That was uh, my man, Chiefy Felix Chiefy Stevenson, and uh, at some points that was uh, Ricky Angles as well, but he kept. Uh, having some technical difficulties with his internet. Uh, but thanks so much for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe uh, and also click the little bell icon below. Uh, if you click the bell icon, that just sort of alerts you to when um, the next show is coming up. We we're supposed to have 32 yesterday, but he had something come up and wasn't able to make it. So we're going to have him next week. So next week is going to be pretty good. We've got uh, on Wednesday, we've got uh, Lil Chris from TOB. And then on Thursday, we've got 32 uh, currently of Junkyard, formerly, of course, of Northeast Groovers and um, Rare Essence and 
also 911. I, I forgot this 911 and the mix band also. So, uh, so we're gonna have him next Thursday. So next Wednesday, a little Chris from TOB. We're gonna get some of the younger guys in here. Um, and uh, yeah, so hey Brooke, don't worry. Uh, it's gonna be up on YouTube. You can see it. Um, so we'll get Ricky back also, so we can get um, you know get the rest of his story as well. And uh, when he's got um, something better than Cricket Wireless going on. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Have a good one.